We couldn't make it to San Francisco for the TCT this year, then there's no problem. We've got you covered with the absolute top highlights of the late breaking sites. In this episode, we'll provide quick takes on the groundbreaking trials of PCI versus bypass, TAVR, left atrial appendage occlusion, pulmonary embolism. We'll also dive into the surprising findings on interventions for saphenous vein grafts, ST elevation MI, and the latest data on shockwave balloon technology and drug coated balloons. This episode is packed with practice changing cardiology that you don't want to miss. Welcome to Cardio Buzz. Welcome to Cardio Buzz. Join us if you want to stay up to date on the latest advances in cardiology. Cardio Buzz sifts through the studies, literature, and gives you the key takeaways for tough cases, all supported by scientific evidence and expert opinions. We'll first start with a lovely topic, music in the cath lab. If you love music, probably your patients might do as well. The MUSE trial revealed that music therapy can benefit patients undergoing a PCI. The study randomized 100 patients into three groups, music before and during PCI, music only before PCI, and the standard of care. The patients who received music both before and during PCI had significantly lower post-procedural systolic blood pressure compared to the other groups. Also, the heart rate and the pain levels were reduced in the music groups with a surprising insignificant reduction in troponin. The physiological rationale suggests that music therapy enhances parasympathetic tone, reduces cortisol catecholamine release, reduces cardiovascular stress. So the trial highlights that music therapy, when sustained throughout PCI, is a safe, effective, inexpensive, and a patient-friendly adjunct in an interventional cardiology. It's funny, but it might make sense next time to ask the patient about their favorite music before going to PCI. And now we move into more serious topics, PCI versus coronary artery bypass graft. It seems that PCI is slowly winning against bypass, even for tough cases like multivessel disease and left main disease. A subset of the FAME 3 trial found that PCI was more cost-effective than cabbage for 1,500 patients with three-vessel coronary disease. PCI guided by FFR and done by Zotorolamus eluting stents had 30% lower cumulative costs over five years compared to bypass. And there was also no significant difference in all-cause mortality or in the composite outcome of mortality, MI, or stroke. These equal survival rates at five years means that there is usually no long-term survival benefit of cabbage to justify the higher costs, making PCI the more cost-effective option for the five years and the 10-year projections. This is, of course, if the patient is a fit for both techniques. Remember that in patients with higher syntax score, the chances of repeat revascularization will always be higher with PCI compared to bypass. When it comes to left main disease, the 10-year results of the NOBLE trial were unveiled. We compared PCI and bypass in patients with unprotected left main coronary artery disease. Also, the study revealed similar all-cause mortality rates after one full decade of stenting versus bypass. A dedicated sub-study highlighted the importance of intravascular ultrasound IVAS to guide the left main PCI, showing significantly lower target vessel revascularization with intravascular ultrasound, 5% versus 12%. This was directly linked to better stent expansion with a higher mean stent area in patients who have done the procedure with IVAS and that virtually could eliminate target lesion revascularization. The key takeaway that geometry is crucial and IVAS makes it visible. While bypass continues to offer durable results, the outcomes of PCI are heavily dependent on procedural optimization. And now moving into structural interventions. For TAVR, the PARTNER3 trial showed similar long-term outcomes for low-risk patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis treated by either TAVR or by SAVR surgery. The study involved 1,000 patients and found that at 7 years, the incidence of death, stroke, rehospitalization was comparable between both groups. Additionally, the valve durability and the patient-reported outcomes appear to be consistent across both TAVR and SEVR, with bioprosthetic valve failure rates of 6.9% with TAVR and 7.3% with surgery. And there was a consistent pattern in the follow-up analysis. There was an initial advantage favoring TAVR in the first year, but then it tends to diminish with time, leading to no significant difference between both groups over long-term follow-ups. It looks like surgery for bioprosthetic valves will diminish further in the future. 
Tell me in your comments what would be the remaining indication for surgical bioprosthetic aortic valve replacement. Perhaps patients with densely calcific valves where surgery was shown to be better than Tever. For left atrial appendage occlusion, the ANDES trial, which is the largest of its kind, randomized 510 patients to either direct oral anticoagulant or dual antiplatelet therapy, and they looked at preventing device-related thrombosis after transcatheter left atrial appendage closure in patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation. Although statistically insignificant, the use of DOEX was associated with improved safety profile, mainly because of lower rates of bleeding and also fewer device-related thrombosis in DOEX patients. And the conclusion is that short-term DOA may be the reasonable and safer antithrombotic strategy after left atrial appendage occlusion, but further larger studies are needed to confirm these findings. And the question here, if DOACs are still necessary after left atrial appendage occlusion, then what's the rationale behind performing the occlusion in the first place? Tell me in the comments what's your view and your expectations of left atrial appendage occlusion. For pulmonary embolism, it seems that mechanical thrombectomy works. A groundbreaking study, the STORM PE, has shown that mechanical thrombectomy significantly reduced RV dilatation in patients with acute, high-risk and intermediate high-risk pulmonary embolism compared to standard anticoagulation. RV dilatation is expressed by the RV-LV ratio that can be measured on echo or CT scan and it indicates strain on the right ventricle that is caused by the pulmonary embolism and is linked to the high risk of early mortality. The STORM PE trial compared a computer-assisted vacuum thrombectomy using the Penumbra flash system in 100 patients and compare that to patients who were given just anticoagulation. The study enrolled patients with acute pulmonary embolism who had an RV to LV ratio of one or greater. The results showed a greater reduction in RV dimensions at 48 hours with the penumbra lightning flash system compared to the anticoagulation only group. Also major adverse events within seven days were numerically less with penumbra compared to the anticoagulation group. This is viewed as a foundational trial and a game changer because it's the first to compare these minimally invasive options to the established gold standard of anticoagulation. Of course, we still need long-term clinical outcomes, but these results will reinforce the growing role of mechanical thrombectomy in managing acute, high-risk and intermediate-risk pulmonary embolism. The next study is a very interesting study. When we have patients who already had coronary artery bypass grafts and they come with degeneration or stenosis in the vein grafts, which usually accompanied by a stenosis in the native vessels. So which vessels should we treat? Should we focus on the vein grafts or rather on the native vessels? The Proctor trial presented surprising findings. Contrary to the current notion that we got from observational data, this randomized trial suggested that PCI on the failed saphenous vein graft is a better course of action than intervening on the bypassed native coronary vessel, especially when the saphenous vein graft treatment is relatively straightforward. The trial randomized 220 patients with graft failure and significant saphenous vein graft stenosis. At one year, the patients who underwent native vessel PCI had a higher rate of major adverse events compared to those who had a saphenous vein graft PCI. The difference was primarily driven by an increase in the PCI-related MIs, and there was no significant difference in mortality, but native vessel PCI required more stents, longer stent length, longer fluoroscopy time, and higher contrast volume. And why is that? Because the Proctor trial focused on patients with relatively straightforward saphenous vein graft lesion compared to those patients who had chronic total occlusion in the native vessels. So this is a more complex challenge, and this comparison is like comparing apples to oranges, highlighting the differences in the complexity between treating a straightforward saphenous vein graft versus a complicated chronic total occlusion. So this trial, despite being terminated early, challenges the belief that native arteries should be opened when a bypass graft fails. Short-term results favor vein graft PCI, while long-term follow-up is vital due to its known lower durability. These practice-changing findings will likely influence future guidelines. Tell me in your comments, what do you prefer to treat first? A native vessel CTO or a degenerated saphenous vein graft? 
For ST Elevation MI, we have two interesting trials. One about intracoronary thrombolysis and the other about treating multivessel disease in ST Elevation MI. The first trial is about thrombolysis, the STRIVE trial. It investigated the effectiveness of a low dose intracoronary multiplase before PCI in STEMI patients with large thrombus burden. Unfortunately, the trial found that this treatment failed to reduce the risk of adverse outcomes, including major adverse events and also microvascular perfusion when compared to just intracoronary saline injection. These results are a bit disappointing and highlighting the ongoing challenge of finding therapies to improve the downstream circulation in STEMI patients with a high thrombus burden. And it seems that microvascular dysfunction might be more complex than we currently understand. We hope that the future would bring us more hope and save more lives. The iModern trial addressed the critical question in treating patients with STEMI and multivessel disease. When should we do the non-culprit vessel? We know from all the trials that complete revascularization is the way to go in STEMI, but there was a constant debate about how to guide PCI for non-culprit vessels and when to do the non-culprit revascularization. The trial enrolled more than 1,000 patients with STEMI and multivessel disease who had already finished a successful primary PCI. And then they were randomized into immediate PCI on table, the non-culprit vessels being treated immediately, guided by IFR. And the other arm were deferred PCI, where the non-culprit lesions were assessed and potentially treated up to six weeks later, guided by cardiac MRI. Looking into death from any cause, recurrent MI or hospitalization for heart failure at three years, immediate IFR-guided PCI was not superior to deferred stress MRI-guided PCI. So both strategies are viable over the long term, potentially giving us the flexibility that we need. So for multivessel PCI and STEMI, complete revascularization is the way to go. Timing, you can, and you can do it either during the index procedure or up to six weeks. But it's important to note that the immediate PCI strategy did show a statistically significant benefit in reducing hospitalizations for heart failure and stroke and TIAs. However, this strategy also showed a trend towards increased total stent thrombosis. So in the middle of the night, you get the MI, Treat the culprit vessel and give yourself some time to treat the non-culprit lesions at ease. Now looking into the shockwave technology. The expensive shockwave balloon technology just took a major hit. Findings from two trials, the shortcut and the victory trials, suggest that cutting balloon angioplasty and the OPN super high pressure non-compliant balloon are non-inferior to intravascular lithotripsy for treating calcified coronary lesions. The shortcut trial, as the name implies, is for the cutting balloon, randomized more than 400 patients with moderate to severe calcification to either IVL or cutting balloon facilitated lesion preparation. And they looked at the post-procedural stent area. And the mean post-procedural minimum stent area was 8.6 mm for IVL and 8 mm for the cutting balloon, with no difference in stent expansion, calcium fracture, strategy success, intra-procedural adverse events, or mace at 30 days between the treatment groups. And of course, the cutting balloon was significantly cheaper, with a difference of more than $3,000, primarily due to the device cost. Another trial, the Victory trial, compared the super high pressure OPN balloon against the IVL for lesion preparation. It randomized 882 patients, Looking again into final stent expansion assessed by OCT. The overall findings showed that the stent expansion was 85% with the OPN group compared with 84% in the IVL group, meaning non-inferiority. Also similar rates of acute procedural and strategy success with no difference in safety outcomes. So the message here, if you're running a cath lab and you're stressed about the high cost of the IVL, just stock enough of OPNs and cutting balloons and keep them handy. You'll get the same outcome without blowing your budget. And now our final trials would be, of course, the drug-coated balloons. If you're interested in drug-coated balloons like myself, you'll definitely be excited about the Solution Serolimus balloon. It was the real highlight at the meeting with two practice-changing trials. First for de novo lesions, the Solution de novo trial involved more than 3,300 patients found that serolimus eluting balloons with bailout stenting were non-inferior to routine drug eluting stent implantation for de novo coronary disease. Target vessel failure was 5.3% in the drug coated balloon group and 4.4% in the drug eluting stent group. 80% of patients treated with the first strategy 
did not require a stent, and also there were low rates of cardiac death and lesion thrombosis in the drug-coated balloon groups. This is probably one of the best comparisons of a PCI strategy using sirolimus eluting balloons versus systematic drug eluting stent implantation in a large international patient population. The trial compared two strategies, one focusing on proper lesion modification and then deciding on drug coated balloon or stent versus systematically implanting drug eluting stents after lesion preparation. The results show no acute concerns, no long-term safety concerns, and are applicable to a significant segment of PCI procedures, of course excluding STEMI and CTO. We are still waiting for long-term five-year data to further evaluate this strategy. For instant restenosis, we got the solution for ISR trial. 418 patients with instant restenosis randomized to drug eluting balloon treatment with solution or the standard of care which included 80% drug eluting stent and 20% plain old balloon angioplasty. Again, solution was found to be non-inferior to the standard of care with target lesion failure around 15% in the DEB group versus 13.5% in the conventional therapy group with no difference in cardiac death, target vessel MI, or target lesion revascularization between the two groups. We should still be cautious about extrapolating the success of solution to other drug-coated balloon platforms. There is clearly no class effect. As we saw in another trial also announced in TCT, which is the caged free trial, that compared drug-coated balloons with drug eluting stents treating also de novo coronary artery disease. The study conducted in China with over 2,200 patients used a paclitaxel eluting balloon called SWIDE from a Chinese company called Shenki Medical. And they found that this DCB was associated with significantly higher rates of cardiovascular death, repeat revascularization compared to drug eluting stent. The higher rate was primarily driven by increased need for target lesion revascularization, whereas cardiovascular death and MI were similar between both groups. So we really need to be careful about which drug eluting balloon to pick. It's not the question of serolimus or paclitaxel. We have good serolimus balloons and we have good paclitaxel balloons. It's the whole platform that matters. And remember, not everything that glitters is gold. Please tell me in your comments what is your favorite drug coated balloon and what strategy do you use to modify the lesions before drug coated balloons or drug eluding stents. And that is your express summary of the TCT 2025 late breaking trials. From PCI versus bypass to the new data on shockwave alternatives and drug coated balloons, the evidence continues to evolve. Now, the most important question what is the one finding from TCT 2025 that will change your practice first? Join the discussion and share your number one takeaway in the comments below. For more practice-changing summaries, subscribe to CardioBuzz.